I also uh, want to uh, welcome you uh, to the annual Campbell Lecture on Childhood Relationships, Risk, and Resilience. Um, Duncan and Cynthia Campbell have really dedicated their lives to improving uh, the welfare and, and the resources of, of vulnerable youth in particular. And uh, this lecture each year is sort of uh, meant to capture that spirit. And uh, we look forward to it each year. It happens this time. It normally kicks off our college's uh, colloquia series. Uh, this year, as you now know, they start at 1 o'clock and not noon. Um, and we're, we're really delighted. Uh, this year that uh, in keeping with the past that we're able to kick off the year with the Campbell Lecture. Um, the Campbells aren't able to be here today, but I know some members of their uh, program, Friends of the Children in Portland, uh, were hoping to come down. Anybody here from Friends of the Children yet? Uh, maybe they'll be, coming in. <laughs> they'll be coming in later, but we're grateful that they're, they're coming down. I've asked Megan McClellan to uh, introduce this year's Campbell speaker. So Megan? Good afternoon. Welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I'm Megan McClellan. I'm the director of the Early Childhood Research Corps here at the Halley Ford Center. We are just delighted and honored to have Dr. Hiro Yoshikawa here to present our Campbell Lecture this year. I'm going to try to make this short, but it's pretty um, difficult. Uh, I'll tell you why, and if you'll realize really quickly. Uh, Dr. Uh, Yoshikawa is the Courtney Sale Ross Professor of Globalization and Education and University Professor at New York University, and also the co-director for the Global Ties for Children Center at NYU. Dr. Yoshikawa is a community and developmental psychologist who studies the effects of public policies and programs related to immigration, early childhood, and poverty reduction on children's development. He also conducts research on culture, sexuality, and youth in the context of HIV AIDS risk and prevention. He literally conducts his work all over the world and influences policy all over the world. Previous to NYU, he served as the Walter H. Gale Professor of Education at Harvard Graduate School of Education and as its dean. He currently serves on the Leadership Council, and if I get this right, I'm going to be really impressed, and as the co-chair of the Early Childhood Development and Education Work Group of the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network, and the which is the research and technical group advising the Secretary General on the 2015 to 2030 Global Development Goals. His research has been funded by many agencies and foundations, including NSF, the Institute for Education Sciences, NIH, and many foundations. He has written many books. I won't go into all of them, but except to highlight the most recent, which is really a blueprint for policy, called Cradle to Kindergarten, a new plan to combat inequality. He also serves on many boards, like the Russell Sage Foundation, the Foundation for Child Development, and the UNESCO Global Education Monitoring Report. In 2014, he was elected to the National Academy of Education. He obtained his PhD in clinical psychology from NYU. And just in case you were not already impressed, he has a master in music, piano performance from Juilliard, <laughs> and a bachelor's in uh, English literature from Yale. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Hiro. Thank you, Megan. Thanks, Megan. That's a little embarrassing. Um, I really have, you know, this, some of these happen, things happened a very long time ago. So. Um, <laughs> I'm going to update my team and take off some of the older stuff. <laughs> um, so um, it's a delight to be here. Thanks so much for the invite. It's been wonderful, uh, uh, Rick and Megan, to get, get to know um, uh, the faculty, the wonderful kind of research practice and policy work that is going on here across disciplines, and um, uh, yeah, and the students and uh, uh, projects here are really, I think, exemplifying um, uh, the goal of trying to make an impact in the world with rigorous uh, social science, public health, um, and uh, you know, research writ large. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some work that has developed over the past 12 years of my career. And so really I was doing primarily US-based work until about 12 years ago when for kind of serendipitous reasons, a couple <coughs> projects, one in China and one in Chile, uh, started. Um, and the project in Chile is still going on, and then over the past several years I've been working a little bit with the uh, countries of uh, 
uh, ministries of education in Colombia and Peru. Um, and the big topic here is how do we um, uh, improve the quality of a kind of marginalized sector of education, uh, which is kind of pre-primary education, and work to bring um, a more evidence-based approach to policy and practice at the national level. So I'm going to give uh, examples, but uh, set a little bit of context um, by first talking about um, where early childhood development sits in um, the current uh, United Nations Global Development Goals, um, and then talk about two efforts to build national systems to monitor and measure and improve quality in early ch public early childhood education um, in Colombia and Peru. And then um, just some snapshots of some initiatives um, that are starting to go to scale of how quality can be uh, maybe improved in um, at scale in public uh, preschool education uh, from Chile and Colombia. So um, starting with uh, where we are in the field as far as putting early childhood development on the global agenda, we're at a historic moment in the field. Um, it's always been a marginalized uh, area of work. There was never at the global level great coordination um, among the multilateral NGOs. Um, just to give an example, coordination between the World Bank and UNICEF, for example, um, on something like early childhood development. That is now occurring so that the leaders of both organizations have put it among their top um, three or four priorities of both of those organizations. And those are both gargantuan organizations, as you know. They don't have a history of playing well together, actually, unfortunately. I mean, they play largely independently. So, so that's why it's kind of exciting that we're at this point. Um, and the field really came together. All the advocacy organizations, um, our network played a, a, a bit of a role, um, certainly UNICEF. Um, and uh, a variety of folks have been working for a very long time on this. And the central argument in one sentence was that beyond survival, children have a right to thrive. And that's because early childhood was solely represented through infant and maternal mortality in the 2000 to 2015 Millennium Development Goals. So the goal, I would say, of our kind of global ECD community, um, which does include the United States, uh, was to kind of... Uh, make an argument about, well, what are the kinds of opportunities for kids to be healthy, um, to learn, um, to have supports for their socio-emotional development, um, uh, assuming that survival issues, basic survival issues, um, are also being dealt with. Um, but let's not ignore those basic health and nutrition issues, which are still uh, uh, very um, uh, critical in, uh, across the world. Just to give a sense, um, uh, infant mortality, uh, between 2000 and 2015, what's your guess about the proportion by which infant mortality was reduced around the world? What percent of infant mortality cases per day do you imagine were cut across 2000 and 2015? That's your guess? Two in ten, like maybe 20 percent? Any other thoughts? It was cut by 50 percent. Um, yeah, so there had been 34,000 um, uh, 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 infant deaths um, per day, and now it's 17,000. Um, that still leaves that 50%, so it's still a critical issue, but it's an enormous um, uh, improvement. Uh, we also have a much stronger evidence base than many other areas of international development. Not many areas can boast that they have a, a large literature in the neuroscience, um, indicating the sensitivity of brain architecture in the developing brain on the one hand and the economics um, of uh, what the uh, returns to investment are of quality early childhood development programs. And so um, these uh, messages have gotten out from the literature, um, the Lancet series. Uh, the Lancet, which is one of the top um, medical journals in the world, has published three series on early childhood development that really helped to bring this onto the global agenda in 2007 and 2011, and most recently this year. Um, these are estimates of the massive costs of if the world continues to invest at its current levels only in the prenatal to uh, age five um, years, uh, that represents a loss of over a quarter of average adult income for 43% of zero to five-year-olds in the world. 
43% of zero to five year olds um, in, sorry, not in the world, in low and middle income countries, so about 250 million, um, uh, experience either stunting or absolute poverty, as the UN defines and the World Bank defines absolute poverty. Um, so that's a massive loss of um, uh, earnings, for, for one thing. Um, and economists have also calculated the societal cost of not achieving certain goals globally, not reducing stunting, for example, to 15%. Stunting right now is still around 38 to 40% in the country of India, for example. It's at those levels generally in low-income countries, um, as defined by the World Bank. And yet, if you were to reduce stunting to 15%, um, you could increase GDP um, by uh, a range somewhere between 3% and 13%, um, this is a select group of countries from Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. Um, countries like Ethiopia, Kenya, Madagascar, Nigeria, Tanzania, Uganda. Um, sorry that the folks can't. I can, I can read this from here, but, uh, so, so I'm going to read off some of these uh, things. Um, and the societal cost of not improving child development through uh, quality pre-primary education and quality home visiting programs like the Jamaican um, Roving Caregivers Program, which is now called Reach Up and Learn, for Child Development Module um, of UNICEF and WHO, which has been adapted for use in um, quite a few countries and tested in RCTs in Pakistan, uh, China, uh, Brazil, and other places. So um, here again, the cost of inaction. If you're in a country that doesn't have access to pre-primary education, you could improve your GDP by as much as 3.6%. That's a country of like Guatemala um, or Nicaragua, 4%. Um, lower in countries that already have um, quite a lot of investment in early childhood. So as usual, the counterfactual the comparison matters. If you are in a country where the access is low, and I can say in the low-income countries, we are still below 20% in terms of access to one-year pre-primary education. Um, and overall in sub-Saharan Africa, that's also true, we're under uh, 20%. So what did all of this evidence kind of coming into the global consciousness create? We do have language in the um, 2015 to 2030 Sustainable Development Goals that says by 2030, um, the world should ensure that all girls and boys have access to quality early childhood development, care, and education um, so that they are ready for primary education. I can say that this phrase, ready for primary education, was actually not a uh, non not non-controversial. It was controversial. Um, and there were some countries um, that don't think that school readiness is the goal of pre-primary education. In the United States, by 1990, we had national panels and national consensus that school readiness is kind of what we should call what children are able to do, their skills across socio-emotional, cognitive, language, numeracy, um, uh, self-regulation by the uh, school entry, and that was kind of something that this country came to a consensus around calling school readiness, right? So we're all familiar with that concept, but that is not true, and this has to do with the cultural variation and the expectations of what citizens are, what children are, what um, adults should be able to do, and the role of early childhood, right? So in Scandinavian countries, for example, these are some of the countries that are really not about school readiness. Um, that's not the purpose that really you should start um, uh, uh, learning um, purely academic skills on your first day of primary schooling, but not before. So um, the experience of preschool at schools are really different. But it made it into the global language because I would say probably the majority of member nations of the UN were, did agree that this actually is a central purpose of pre-primary education. Target 4.2 has two indicators. I'm not going to get into the complexities of how indicators are defined um, by the UN Stats Commission and different agency stats commissions, but um, what was nice was that um, the kinds of notions of early childhood development that we have in the United States, that it's a multi-domain concept, right? It's not um, just about emergent literacy skills, neither is it just about development, but it's a multi-domain concept, got into the SDGs, despite the fact that indicators, from a UN perspective, should only measure one thing. So um, I was in many conversations where people are like, what is this? No, like, wait, first of all, like, it sounds like it's three different things, at least three different things. The language says developmentally on track and health, learning, and psychosocial well-being. Um, so I think it was a victory of the global community to kind of smush those domains into one 
indicator and say that there is a value in measuring early childhood development, not piecemeal. Um, but what we know um, is that uh, from brain science is that these domains are intertwined, but they are distinct, right? So they're correlated with each other, but they have different um, uh, predictors and they have somewhat different consequences. And yet together we can call it um, this concept of what are the skills that make you more likely to succeed in uh, early years of schooling and later. Um, and then there is an access indicator of participation in organized learning. But you notice that the word quality is in the target. It's not in the indicators, and that's because there is no global consensus. We are not near a global consensus on how to measure quality in early childhood development programs and policies. Um, but we see that quality, access, and child development are all in this UN language. So a country that wants to act on target 4.2 within SDG 4, which is the Education and Lifelong Learning Goal, um, should um, technically pay attention to quality and access together. We would probably agree with that. Um, but also think about um, using child development outcomes to inform their policies. Um, so that's what the rest of this talk is about, is how do you create national systems that pay attention to quality, access, and child development simultaneously? And what are some concrete examples of how to actually improve quality that might be driven um, and benefit from some of this evidence and the idea of measurement? Um, so it turns out there's a global initiative for this that was started uh, several years ago by a um, collaboration between multiple um, uh, multilateral uh, organizations, UNESCO, Brookings, UNICEF, um, and the... Uh, and the World Bank. Um, so this is a global effort to improve measurement at national levels in early childhood programs and policies by focusing on, as it says in the acronym, both early learning, meaning child development, and quality. So it's a two-pronged initiative. Um, so there are a set of researchers who have played um, a collaborative, uh, done collaborative work to help develop both the quality measure and the child development called Melco. Um, and uh, it's been a very interesting process. I mean, uh, at various points, um, there was on the table, oh, could a single global measure be created in either of these domains? Um, versus what's the country level adaptation uh, uh, process if there were a single uh, uh, original measure? Um, all the way to, is this just an inventory? of measures that have been used and validated in different countries to something in between. That is, there you know, a suite of tools, and maybe they're more regional in focus. Maybe they are um, for countries that are somewhat similar culturally and might um, benefit from a, a common regional kind of tool. Um, this came out of the SDG process and the notion of um, uh, MDG and SDG indicators being typically things where at some point folks like to kind of compare countries, and we can argue about whether that's appropriate for early childhood development, but certainly it's been a big part of the drive to reduce infant mortality, um, the drive to improve access to primary education and now secondary and pre-primary education, um, these things that are somewhat easier to measure, um, perhaps, than early childhood development skills like numeracy. Uh, language literacy, socio-emotional development. Um, the issue here is that the existing kind of gold standard measures um, cost money, right? So the most widely used quality measures for classrooms in the United States cost money. Um, they are out of reach of low and middle income countries. So the goal was, can we start with the open source free um, instruments so we don't get into any kind of legal problems? and build some consensus measures around perhaps some of the common items that uh, uh, researchers in different contexts and different countries have, have perhaps shown um, are valid and predictive uh, uh, constructs and items and uh, tasks. Um, the other uh, uh, assumption is that for a national system um, to inform early childhood development programs and policies, we do need to have both quality and child development measures, and those linked to each other as the basis for decision making. That if we only had a child development measure, 
um, you don't get enough of a sense of what are the inputs into it and what to improve. If you only have a quality measure, first of all, you don't know whether it predicts to child development, so you don't know whether it's valid in that sense. Um, and, but together, you get a picture of both how kids are doing across the country or within a subregion, uh, like a state, like Oregon, or, uh, and you can get a picture of where quality is nationally and perhaps where some of the gaps are, and maybe then where should professional development or quality improvements so that's why um, there are two uh, uh, core instruments that were developed in the initial phase of MELCO, and they're called, um, in the tradition of let's make acronyms that all sound alike, <laughs> let's create two statistical things like mediation and moderation that sound similar. But, um, so the MELCO has two um, measures, one called the MODEL and the other called the MELEE. Uh, the model is the child development measure. The melee is, is the model. I don't even know what it stands for. The melee is the measure of the early learning environment. Um, and these are just some examples of the kinds of measures that conceptually or in reality it was based on. Um, so, uh, uh, and some of these are some of the usual um, suspects. But uh, I would say the child development and learning measure, uh, about half of it comes from one preceding measure that actually our team at NYU has done a variety of psychometric studies on, and that's the Save the Children IDELA instrument, which I would say is a very good, robust instrument. Um, and we've now looked at about seven or eight country data sets and have a couple papers that we could share on that. That's with Peter Halpin um, at NYU and Sharon Wolf, um, who was a postdoc with our center and is now um, an assistant professor at UPenn GSE. Um, so uh, this is to help um, provide a national or subnational picture of the quality of pre-primary education. The I'm talking about the quality instrument now. We say over and over again this should not be used to hire or fire, um, but to inform quality improvement efforts of various kinds. Right? Um, the child assessment, um, just to give a sense of uh, its uh, subdomains, um, include quantitative or numeracy uh, skills. There's a very interesting story of what you can call this in different countries. <laughs> Um, so, uh, depending on whether they, uh, their reactions to words like math or numeracy uh, versus quantitative reasoning or spatial or, I mean, it has a variety of these things in it, but these are things like spatial relations, verbal counting, one-to-one -one correspondence, comparing numbers, magnitude, mental addition, a block design task, um, socio-emotional, which is um, emotional identification in self and others, and some conflict resolution. Uh, this is the direct child assessment. The pro-social and externalizing behaviors are, are more in the teacher and parent report. Um, for language, vocabulary, production, syllabic segmentation, initial, initial kind of sound identity, these are kind of, for those of you who are experts in these areas, these are pretty well um, uh, considered subdomains of oral comprehension. And for executive function, it actually only has two um, of the uh, 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 three kind of main subdomains in early childhood. Um, it has inhibitory control with the head, toes, knees, shoulders task, which is uh, you know, the leaders on that measure is here. Um, and forward and backward digit span to capture uh, working memory, but the cognitive flexibility is actually not in this, this Melco child assessment. Um, the quality assessment is quite comprehensive, um, and it was designed to capture both the classroom uh, the program, and then the systems that support program quality, um, including professional development systems. So the director survey, so there are surveys of directors, teachers, and parents, and then there is a classroom observation based on a full morning of observation in a pre-primary setting. So the director survey includes things like inclusion, links to other services, professional development provision, the director's um, uh, qualifications, um, overall attendance and training uh, approaches. The teacher survey has the teacher's own qualifications in education, how much they reach out and how they reach out to families and communities, professional development experiences and contact with other services. Um, parents are asked about their experiences of parent and community engagement from the center and reasons for selection of that center um, and fees, how much they pay. Um, and then the observation covers things like the physical environment um, around the center, in the center, in the classroom, the learning materials and resources that are available, the quality of teacher-child interactions, and specific areas of content instruction. 
So that's a lot to cover. Um, and so one of the things I'm going to talk about is the limitations of when you have a very limited number of items and what you can cover uh, uh, with such an ambitious kind of classroom observation. That really, the core of it, I would say, is the quality of teacher-child interactions that's much like the class in the United States, or the TIPS, um, which was developed by Seidman and colleagues for low middle income countries. Um, so now I'm going to tell you what happened in two countries, um, Colombia and Peru. Uh, and what's started to become a little bit of a regional um, project across countries in these um, Andean countries. So uh, in 2015, um, a request from Colombia to Link Hagen at Teachers College, Angie Pongota was at Yale and me, um, came to adapt a MELCO measure. They really liked the overall framework and the comprehensiveness of those surveys and those constructs um, to adapt it to the country of Colombia with their governance structure, which is a cross-sectoral um, uh, commission on early childhood in Colombia. Um, we did that, kind of adapted the measure pretty extensively. Um, and I can talk later about, if, if folks are interested, about what was different about between an original measure for primarily very academically focused context of East Africa to a more play-based and exploratory system of education <coughs> in Colombia. Um, did a small pilot study in 30 um, public centers. Uh, then in 2016, there was data collection, a large regionally representative study, which I'm going to show you data from. In the coffee growing, in the kind of, well, coffee growing, so I guess that's not entirely Oregon, but like, you know, not quite as coffee obsessed, I would say, but the coffee <laughs> is growing and it's really their livelihood. This is for the coffee growing area of Colombia that maybe we've seen like misty commercials. Um, sometimes for Colombian coffee on TV. Um, at the same time, in 2016, a request came from the Peruvian Ministry of Education to pilot these measures in Lima. And so these two teams started talking to each other. And um, we have an, analyzed the first Colombian study. Colombia is moving to its first nationally representative um, study, which is data collected um, this October and November. And the same in Peru. October and November will be the collection of the first nationally representative um, studies of quality and early childhood development in both countries. And uh, we will have handed off the analyses to our Colombian collaborators for the national study, but we'll do them for the Peruvian study. Um, but the goal is to kind of do this um, handoff and collaboration. <coughs> so lots of partners um, in Colombia that I won't go into. Um, this is smack in the middle of Colombia, um, so it's between the kind of coast and the Andes. Um, so uh, Colombia is an extremely geographically diverse region. I can say it's a beautiful region, it's a beautiful country, it's worth going to for travel for all kinds of reasons. Uh, um, but for data reasons, <laughs> um, this was uh, sampled by the National Education Statistics Agency, kind of the equivalent of ETS. What ETS in, is in the United States, the agency ICBES is in Colombia. So they sampled it to be regionally representative, um, uh, and the data came from 14 municipalities, 100 centers, 186 classrooms, um, and uh, about uh, 1,100 children um, and their parents, uh, three, four, and five year old uh, children. Um, one key thing, and what's been interesting to um, see when we work outside the United States, is in the United States we have a richness of researchers interested in quality of preschool education. So we have lots of people who can train on this. Right now in Latin America, there's kind of one person. Um, and so we had brought in uh, Professor Carolina Maldonado, who um, got her PhD actually at uh, uh, Pittsburgh with Elizabeth Rotruba. Um, and in Colombia, she had already been um, doing studies of the efforts and the class, these North American instruments, to look at the quality of preschool education. Um, and so she um, uh, has become the training uh, center for multiple countries, actually. And so she has a group of 30, 40 uh, uh, people to reliability in this classroom observation instrument. And she's done that in Nicaragua, Peru, and Colombia, Colombia twice now. Um, and she's at the Universidad de Los Andes in Bogota. The child development measure training came out of the CDL group, um, which is led by Magdalena Janis and Linda Paras. 
um, and uh, had its own separate uh, training. It was a little bumpier, um, so there were some more modifications to the instrument that we had to make. Now I'm going to go a, a little bit into what the measures were, and then um, I also wanted to show you how our results were communicated to the minister a couple months ago, because it's an inter there were these interesting questions of how do you communicate um, uh, quality findings to a practitioner and a policy audience, right? So, um, and any input you have will be useful because we tried to figure out how to um, talk about kind of both average levels of a particular domain of quality, but then like how do you talk about the magnitude of the relationship between quality and child outcomes when neither are things that are on a scale that anyone understands? So, um, and talking about effect sizes um, also doesn't actually really translate. So we figured out something, and I would love to hear what you think of it. So um, our, we have structural quality features and process quality features. So um, this is just how um, the negative physical environment index looks different from the kinds of things we might be uh, kind of thinking of as hazards in the United States. This includes things like landmines, um, uh, construction materials, roaming dogs or other animals, and certainly in low-income countries, some of these can be large animals, not so much in Colombia. Uh, not like yaks or elephants, but, uh, but still land. Um, uh, sharp or rusting clay materials. Um, there was a lot of like uh, you know uncovered and unprotected kind of wires and sockets and those kinds of things that actually had some of the highest rates. Um, uh, dangerous kitchen activities occurring like right there, um, you know, in the same space. So. Uh, and then toilets um, and, uh, you know, kind of hygiene and sanitation issues. I would say these are much better in a country like Colombia than in a low-income country like Tanzania. But still, these are on the index. And the average among these, like, 20-some of these kinds of negative things was 7.35% or a range of 3 to 15. Um, learning materials, um, we start seeing um, that these do contrast with your average American preschool. We worry about the quality in preschools, but the level of resources is simply lower. 31% um, had no activity centers in the classrooms or in the centers and we uh, programs as a whole, and we counted activity centers if they were like going to another room. So that was counted whether it was in the classroom or outside the classroom. Areas for dramatic or imaginative, imaginative play, the majority didn't have that. Um, the concept of at least 50 blocks or other manipulatives, 52% had um, fewer than 50. Books accessible to children, 55% had fewer than five books accessible to children, and 72% had no materials related to diversity. Colombia is a country with 110 languages and lots of indigenous groups, so diversity really matters. It really is a big initiative of the government to try to incorporate that into curricula, um, and they distribute materials, and we couldn't see them, right? so they weren't actually... Um, just to give a sense of the quality of interactions, one sample item is the teacher stimulates new or creative thinking among children. Uh, level one, the lowest quality, this is a four-point scale, was the teacher never or rarely asks ch questions of individual children. Uh, level two is asks closed-ended uh, questions the majority of the time. Three asks questions that are open-ended. Four asks questions that promote personal opinions, elaboration, or creation of new ideas or thinking or reflection the majority of the time. So you see how that um, really gets to this idea of open-ended and elaborated conversations. Um, and this uh, particular area of quality of interactions um, showed uh, a um, semi-acceptable reliability of about 0.64. Uh, with items like the teacher connects learning with their, the children's experiences, the teacher consistently provides feedback that extends child learning, interacts with each child in an individual manner, encourages autonomy in the choice of activities, um, has a mix of activities during the day, including small and full group uh, activities. Um, and here, actually, the average quality was right in the middle of the scale, and it looked fairly normal. Um, but the way this was presented to practitioners was to go into each of those items and describe, for example, okay, if our sample was between two and three, what is two, and what does that look like in the classroom, and what's three, and what does that look like, right? So, so examples like the typical kind of going around a class and asking each child um, how their uh, last day went. Let's say it's Monday, and so it's circle time, and you're doing that. And, and a child gives an answer, um, 
and the teacher says, uh, bueno, bien, or like, and then goes to the next kid. And then it's just this like repetitive, you know, each child is asked the same question and then it ends versus something that's a little more extended. So these kinds of examples, um, and it turned out um, the practitioners really kind of ate this up. They thought this was actually really useful. And so uh, Ana Nieto, who is the director of early childhood education for the country, created these slides. I just wanted to show them to you to see what, how she did it. So the one to four scale has color coding. And so she shows uh, this group, here's where in your region, and we were sitting in that region, not all drinking coffee, but we were sitting in that region. Um, and she shows kind of where they are on a scale on particular items, and then describes the, uh, if it was 1.3 or something, what the one is and what a two would be. And so what a change from one unit to another might represent. Um, that's just to show that the process quality looks normally distributed. We had um, much more serious problems with content instruction, which is that the rates of not observing anything were so high that we couldn't actually create a scale. So does the teacher read printed materials? Well, two thirds of them don't at all. Do they engage in verbal storytelling? This is kind of shocking for a play-based, kind of expo exploration-based uh, preschool um, quality standards. 81% did not engage in verbal storytelling. 81% did not introduce new vocabulary or encourage their use. 91% um, did not introduce writing conventions. That was not a surprise because they don't think that's appropriate. Um, teachers um, uh, generally don't encourage children to use numbers to count. Um, and in some places where I've seen this, uh, uh, it's completely rote, and so kids know how to count to 20, but there's no one-to-one -one correspondence in that. 90% um, uh, of uh, children are not um, uh, using any objects or manipulatives for anything related to math. You know, magnitude or uh, uh, or sorting or um, uh, arithmetic or any of these kinds of math skills. Um, they don't encourage activities related to shapes. Children don't engage in problem solving, conjecture, prediction, uh, or hypothesis making. So, so what are they doing? Well, they're doing a lot of. Uh, they are doing a lot of singing and dancing. There's a lot of arts going on. Um, that item, though, is now being. Um, uh, revised by the Peruvian ministry, interesting. Both teams have really nice pedagogical teams associated with them. But for example, the songs in Peru are things that are also wrote. And so there's not actually the opportunity to create new art, right? So the idea of creative artistic instruction is also not kind of taking hold in these places. So we had to use, we took the items that weren't like 90, 10, um, that were a little bit better than that, and we just used them as dichotomous items. Um, our next step is we're going to try to see whether we can do factor analysis with censored variables like this, and we do our statistician Peter is, is interested in that, um, but this is uh, not um, not that encouraging. But um, shows directions that professional development can go in, right? So that's the idea: is the quality measure gives ideas for what the system can start to um, uh, encourage, and these practitioners. Um, seeing these data did not have any resistant responses. They said, this is great, this is very helpful, we want help in learning how to do these. So, um, so that's what's uh, nice. So did these predict child development domains? Um, we did a multi-level analysis. They had random effects for classrooms and centers because uh, in part this was uh, designed to be regionally representative. We are aiming to kind of generalize to the region. Um, so we have covariates, very basic ones, child age, gender, household assets, and parental education. Uh, and then we put in for structural quality some usual suspects, teacher education, years teaching in early childhood, exposure to professional development in the last year, and then that central scale of pedagogical quality, um, and uh, those kind of about six or seven content instruction items. So um, what we found uh, on the structural part was, um, as we often find in the US, teacher education had nothing to do with uh, child outcomes. Um, and uh, additional years of ECE experience, though, was associated with higher executive function and language skills. So to make the social map out of this, um, these are not large effects. Uh, 10 additional years of experience working with early childhood um, was associated with um, about 3% uh, increase in uh, the executive function scores and 4% in language. 
Um, what the Educational Statistics Agency asked us to do was scale these um, subscales on a 0 to 100. So 100 being the maximum possible score and 0 being the lowest. Um, so 0 on every task or item. And so taking that 0 to 100 scale, we can talk about percentages. So um, then I think in the back of our minds, we still, I always still want to know what the effect size is. So, um, so that's something. But but this is what um, got recommended, and that's what we um, uh, uh, related. Um, years of EC and exposure to professional development were both correlated, zero order correlations, with pedagogical quality. And so the next step will be um, linking the structural to the process quality, and then process quality to child outcomes. Um, the pedagogical quality scale was associated with higher socio-emotional and executive function skills. Um, significantly and at a trend level with language skills with a magnitude of association in about the 0.12 to 0.15 range if you're thinking more like beta coefficients. Um, and we said, to interpret this, we said, we've described to you what a 1 and a 2 look like or a 2 and a 3 look like at the item level. Uh, an increase from one level to the next is associated with about a 9% increase um, in socio-emotional skills, so where the label got lost, and about a 6 percent increase in executive function skills. So let me know if that social math seems <laughs> acceptable, but that's how we decided to present those results. The use of books and written materials was related to higher levels of language, which is nice of that uh, little item, and to perhaps press um, the system to get, uh, they distribute a whole lot of materials and the teachers don't use them, right? So that's like a great big waste of um, uh, resources. So they will be, um, uh, uh, focusing on this. Um, interestingly, this artistic expression item, uh, uh, instruction on artistic expression that actually emphasizes creativity was related to lower levels of aggressive behavior as reported by teachers, um, and so there might be some mechanisms there that we don't quite know yet. Um, peer interactions were generally positive, but the promotion of conflict resolution was um, uh, uh, in a way that encouraged autonomy was quite low. So there was a sense that the behavior management practices, when they were used, were really quite elementary and not that sophisticated as far as getting children to resolve conflicts in a kind of scaffolded uh, way. So what is the Ministry of Education doing with these data? Um, they are uh, inform the data are informing their coaching and curricular development um, policies. They have started to introduce coaching systems, but without much kind of content. <laughs> So the coaches have so far not been given a lot of guidance on what to do. And so this gives them the rationale to say, okay, we are going to focus on the kinds of things that are in our pedagogical quality measure, um, and we are also going to try to talk to the institutes of higher education that provide teacher training in pre-primary education. Um, they also want to start what's called a quality laboratory, which is to encourage innovation and new approaches to quality improvement initiatives that are designed by researchers um, uh, and then evaluated. So they have a, a private foundation that has agreed to cough up money and they'll have a kind of national competition to start uh, working on areas of quality that focus in particular on these kinds of process quality indicators. And then this um, pro uh, move towards a nationally representative study um, uh, with the plan to possibly do that every three years um, and report this within the SDG framework. Um, so this is, uh, uh, as I told you, um, kind of um, spreading to other countries, Nicaragua and Peru, with support from the World Bank. Um, there's an intermediary function of the World Bank um, and a particular person from the World Bank office in Washington who's supporting these efforts in all three countries. Um, Interestingly, the initial pilot study of 200 centers in Lima showed virtually identical distributions at the item level of these process quality items. And so we literally put them side by side and they looked exactly the same. So this kind of content instruction and pedagogical quality looked very similar in Peru and in Colombia. Um, so this will be integrated with quality improvement efforts in both countries. Carolina will play this continued central role. Um, her lead trainer just wants to get her doctorate University of Michigan, um, but uh, she will continue to kind of lead this and have her team. Um, she's hiring a postdoc, so if anyone has a, wants to move to Bogota, she would be a fabulous person to work with. She could work all over Latin America on quality. Um, 
Uh, Abby Rakes directs the Melco Consortium. She's at the University of Nebraska and used to be at um, UNESCO. Um, and uh, it's about nine countries, uh, researchers working in nine countries in East Asia, including now in some high income countries. So Nirmal Rao is testing out these measures in places like Singapore um, and Hong Kong, and uh, there's some work in China. Uh, the World Bank is promoting the use of these as adaptations. Um, I think we all agree that the quality instrument requires a lot more adaptation than the child development one. There is a little bit more of a sense as, especially as um, countries sign on to the notion of school readiness and they are encouraging things like language literacy and numeracy as key skills, um, but also socio-emotional skills in the 21st century economies, um, that they, that may have some universals, um, particularly for preschool systems that are more academic oriented. I think the quality instrument is something that is just going to be country specific um, because contexts, these are contexts and measuring context is just inherently different from measuring um, individual child skills. So I'm going to wrap up by two, two just brief profiles of initiatives in Latin America that are examples of um, how to build uh, data and evidence into um, quality improvement. Um, so, Un Buen Comienzo in Chile and a program called IO2 in Colombia. Um, so, Un Buen Comienzo is the project that got me into the global uh, arena and it started in 2006 um, with a partnership between the Harvard Graduate School of Education and the uh, Universidad Diego Portales in Santiago and a foundation um, called the uh, Fundación Educacional Oportunidad in Santiago. And uh, after a 18-month process of bringing the leading stakeholders in preschool education together in Chile to um, come up with a plan for how to improve quality. There had already been some small-scale studies showing that there was almost no instruction going on in terms of instructional quality, you know, maybe six or seven minutes a day. Um, so the goals were to promote um, aspects that are familiar from the class but also a primary focus on language outcomes and secondary on socio-emotional, and to introduce coaching for the first time in an uh, uh, impact evalu uh, uh, an evaluated teacher professional development program in Latin America. So coaching supports twice a month after a monthly workshop the week before, and the coaching uh, uh, observation is preceded by a conversation with, between the teacher and the coach, and then immediately afterwards there's a kind of debrief conversation between the uh, teacher and the um, that was version one, and we did an RCT. Um, the RCT showed significant and moderate to large impacts on the class on those three uh, uh, subscales, but no significant impacts on language. Um, however, we noticed that on an average day, 25% of the kids weren't there. Um, and on an average year, uh, a kid missed 25% of the days. So when we zeroed in on the high attenders, we found significant impacts um, on some of the decoding skills, so things like letter word identification. So we could tell that it was starting to go in the right direction. Um, so the second phase of the work in the last four years has been to introduce um, the Institute on Healthcare Improvement's approach to continuous quality improvement. And for those of you who are familiar with what IES was, was doing under John Easton, this is part of the research practice partnerships when they um, unveiled it, and this is what Tony Bright has been pushing at the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching about the past five years, and we started this, we happened to just fall into this um, because our health director of our program knew people at the Institute on Healthcare Improvement in Cambridge. So this is an approach to rapid cycle um, focus on goal setting and quality, um, developing metrics for um, quality within a system, engaging stakeholders who meet every three months in a learning collaborative, and these are people from teachers, assistant teachers, coaches, um, regional ministry uh, folks, health clinic uh, folks, so it's a fairly um, uh, diverse group that meets every three months. And just to give an example, um, one set of schools decided to introduce one new vocabulary word per day with rotating strategies for incorporation of the new word. I should say the original experiment had no dosage or required or suggested frequency in it because that was not possible in Chile at the time. It's actually very much like how Colombia is. Like they say, okay, you should try to read books and use the print materials, but they don't give any kind of sense of like what the expectation might be. So this instead was built in the second round by the stakeholders themselves. So they decided, for example, they knew from the experiment that only about 10 minutes of 
rich language instruction occurred in a preschool day. They initially decided, let's make that an hour. They realized that was impossible. They cut that back to half an hour. So these are the kinds of things that can happen in the CQI process. Um, so they created a metric, which was uh, the number of children in the classroom who use the new word with versus without adult support. And so what you do in this CQI approach is you actually, as a teacher, um, measure that every day. And you put it on a, on a little Excel spreadsheet. And if it's successful, you're seeing, for example, that the proportion of kids who um, use a new word spontaneously without the support of you, the teacher, should go up over this month. This is Actually, this is three months or, um, uh, daily. And then get back together and like, oh, what worked, what didn't work? You know, in your three months, when did the, the line go down or like you know, with these kinds of metrics? Um, so I'm going to show you the impacts um, across the different phases of the experiment. Like I told you, the full sample, this is for language and emergent literacy. And in the full sample, we found no effects. For the high attenders, we found effects on letter word identification and emergent writing. Um, when CQI started being introduced and then intensified, we started seeing wider um, effects. Um, the caution here is um, the, only this part is truly experimental. The rest are quasi-experimental using propensity score uh, methods. Um, and the same kind of pattern for um, executive function and socio-emotional. So these effects started to widen in scope as continuous quality improvement basically raised the dosage of the intervention uh, in the classroom. And the class scores have also um, gradually gone up um, uh, from uh, somewhere around one point something for instructional support gradually up um, closer to uh, three and now I think above three. Um, the last example I wanted to give you because I think it's exciting and it's the first demonstration of uh, the first causal test of the Reggio Emilia model is in Colombia. Um, it's a program called IO2 run by the Fundacion Carrillo, which is a, a supermarket-based <laughs> foundation, um, but run by a super interesting social entrepreneur who once changed the um, poverty reduction policy in Colombia. He created this program. Now he runs a soccer NGO. <laughs> um, I want a career like that. <laughs> I think you're going to have a career. <laughs> um, anyhow, so this is arts and music based, um, like Radio Emilia is. There are resident artists in the program, there is coaching, there are curricular guides, but it's a little bit different, right? It's project based learning. For those of you familiar with this, much more constructivist in approach, and we are seeing some positive effects on uh, language, um, receptive vocabulary, and uh, math from this uh, program. And it, it is also showing some effects on observed classroom quality. And it is now um, starting to be implemented by the federal agency that runs the primary public preschool models in Colombia. So it's scaling up to two or 300 preschools, which is large for Radio Emilia, right? Um, and to be implemented, it's a handover between the original foundation and the federal government. So this is kind of an interesting uh, program evaluated by Milagros Norris at uh, NIR and Raquel Bernal, who's at the Universidad de Rosario. Uh, economist who has done a lot of the most important studies of early childhood quality um, uh, in Colombia. So um, the goal here is how do we build evidence into monitoring systems. National monitoring systems worldwide are generally um, really dreary supervisor checklists. How many kids are attending? You know, is there like an open terrible hazard going on? Um, is basic health and nutrition being provided? And then this area of pedagogical quality, that phrase exists in the Colombian quality standards. It has no definition. That's it. It says, build pedagogical quality. So our study for the first time says, OK, here are some strategies that are what pedagogical quality could be. And lo and behold, there is some variation. It looks like it is predicting some of your child outcomes. So, so that's, the, that's the idea, is to build this notion that has been more familiar in the United States context for longer, but for the first time in countries that um, have not had this. Um, I think the idea of promoting quality labs for innovation and education and evaluation, which are the kinds of projects that you do here at the Halley Ford Center, that's also an interesting movement in uh, regions like Latin America as they start building and have the capacity for very top-notch researchers in their universities to um, uh, build and evaluate quality improvement interventions. Uh, 
Um, and then I think um, our center, uh, we had no idea when we started the center three and a half years ago that measurement will be one of the top requests that comes to us from countries around the world. And that is um, the economists who do the typical World Bank evaluations, they realize they don't know how to measure um, child development and learning, <laughs> so they come to us. Uh, they realize that quality matters because they all spend a million and a half dollars on it. RCT, and then they'll find a null effect, and they'll have some sense that various parts of the implementation went wrong, but they don't have um, quality measures typically to go, um, or implementation measures that are systematic. So those are um, areas where I think any of you could make an enormous difference um, in many, many countries around the world, as I think the global development agenda in the area of education and child development is moving to integrate much better measures of a variety of constructs. So um, thanks uh, very much to um, you all. And okay, so thank you so much. Um, we're at, at exactly 2 o'clock now. But the best part of these sessions is always the questions and the answers. And this is a group that generally likes to ask them. Uh, so I'm going to ask them, if you need to, to leave, fine, but I'm going to ask that we just extend this by five minutes so that we have some time to do that. Um, so if you need to leave, go ahead and slip out. There's also going to be a reception now for half an hour afterward in the lobby. Um, so you can also continue to talk. But let's have a few minutes for Q&A. So who'd like to get us started? This is the fun part. I know you have questions. You always have questions. Chenoweth. Uh, you mentioned about the importance of a country's measurement in terms of childhood development, which often butt head with the standardization, universalization that UN agencies like to do. So my question is, in your experience and observation, to what extent Latin American national government, especially Ministry of Education, uh, take this seriously, such as devoting resources and take action to develop their more contextualized uh, quality measurement or adaptation from the standardized uh, measurement? Sure. Um, that's a cool one. <laughs> um, the, uh, the short answer on quality measurement is that nobody has. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, very few countries are using any quality measure. Um, the national level, um, and I should not speak for primary education, but for um, this kind of little arena of pre-primary um, education. Uh, so let alone whether there's something that's standardized across countries, right? So um, the, uh, the global mechanism to support SDG 4.2 in the early childhood arena comes out of UNESCO, and um, they are... Uh, Issuing tech, they have issued technical guidelines um, for what cross-country comparability is, um, uh, and we can apply our kind of usual measurement and variance kinds of approaches to doing this. And we don't, um, we find a mixed pattern of results for the child development area. Um, for the quality area, the measures aren't even quite close enough to do that. The Peruvian measure, the, their pedagogical team went in and, and redefined some of the one, two, three, fours. They generally kept the items, but they did a very thoughtful job. And I feel like this measure is getting better with each country that's working on it. But that means that even these two measures that are very quite similar, but we can't actually do something that's literally comparing the means because they're not exactly the same <laughs> measure. And I just think we're going to run into that with quality. And no measure of quality made it into uh, the UN's top tier defined indicators. Um, right now, there are about 279 indicators in the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. And they each got rated into three. They were first rated into a traffic light system of green, uh, yellow, and red. <laughs> um, now they're just tier one, two, and three. The early childhood development indicator was argued to be tier one and voted it to tier three. Um, it turns out a 10-item measure of um, kind of parent report uh, with two items per each of five domains just isn't going to show great psychometric qualities, right? So, so right now it's considered under, and UNICEF is doing that um, for the child development area. But quality, I think we're just further away. Great. Next question. 
Bobby? Uh, well, so I'm sitting here listening, and the assumption is that the need is in the third world. And, um, but like Chile is way ahead of us in offering, even off reaching the children. So I just wanted you to put in context and, and, and measuring quality across all our programs, we're not even close. Um, or in agreement on measures of child development or quality. So I just, could you spend a couple of minutes putting this international work in context with uh, work within the United States? Sure, yeah. Um, the basic fact, of course, is that of the, we have 5% of the world's kids, and 95% of the world's kids are outside the United States, right? So that's one basic fact I always start with. And then if I think of the kind of richness of the numbers of researchers here to work on these issues, despite the massive need that still continues to exist. Yeah, so there's two things, right? Yes, obviously there's like an infinite amount of work to do here. It's much more complex, made more complex by decentralized government, by our state uh, and uh, federal relationship, right? Um, in the global context, India and Brazil have some of these Characteristics: The Brazilian federal government cannot roll out a national quality measure, for example, for preschool. So what's going on in the conversation in Brazil right now is, oh, which state might do this first or something like that, right? India, everything has to be like the UNICEF office has like all these state offices. Their largest state is about 225 or 250 million people. So it's nearly as large as the United States as one state in India, right? So we're talking the scale that is really, really different. The Lancet series shows where the risk is in early childhood development, and it's overwhelmingly in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. Um, so when I work in Latin America, I am quite aware of the fact that Latin America is quite more advanced um, than other regions. So um, our center works also in Sub-Saharan Africa and now in the Middle East with Syrian refugee populations. But um, yeah, so, so these are certainly countries that have the capacity to start to do something like national uh, studies. Um, on the other hand, the World Bank is now funding and UNICEF, you know, there are 20 new uh, countries with massive new investments in early childhood development. So the World Bank is acting as a player to encourage each of these countries to incorporate these kinds of measures into their work. Um, so it's kind of a global movement to bring this. Um, uh, and I would say that the United States research models have been certainly very influential. Um, so. Uh, so there's a value in simply kind of demonstrating what methods can do in the kind of area of uh, improving quality of a sector like health or education. Um, but I think uh, there is a, there are very strong reasons to also work in other uh, countries. So Chile is now a rich country. It's the um, it's an OECD country and it's within the category of high income countries and it's the only one in South America. It has very large levels of inequality, like ours. Right? Um, Peru is quite a bit poorer. Um, the, if we think about Latin America, we, you, you do want to think about risk, and the, the poorest and the most, and the, where the kids are most at risk are in Guatemala and the rest in El Salvador, right? so the central, uh, the northern triangle, I guess they call it, in Central America. So, yeah, so there are these differences once you get within region um, uh, to think about. Excellent. Um, all right, one, one more quick question. You get the last word, and then, um, and then we'll continue the conversation in the lobby. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, I was wondering for your language component, how you accounted for different languages, if, there, if it wasn't their native language. And there's a lot of diversity, I think you mentioned in Colombia. Yeah, Eje Cafetero as a region is all, yeah, there were no other languages in that particular region, um, but it will be an issue in other uh, uh, regions in the national. Study. So um, there's a very interesting, I just am um, finishing up a chapter with uh, one of my collaborators in Colombia who was the sub-director working under Ana Nieto and her predecessor on quality. Um, and he's an ethnographer and had done work in at least three indigenous communities in Colombia. But he was one of the people who um, uh, proposed and then they have implemented a modality of services within the national ECD policy. The national ECD policy is called De Cero Siempre, which is uh, really kind of fits the country of Gabriel Garcia Marquez. It means from zero to uh, forever, right? Zero to, from zero to always. Uh, so it's 
a very poetic name for a national policy. But within national quality standards, the question is how can indigenous communities be allowed the space to create their own curricular frameworks, guidelines, and values uh, built on their value systems and their basically their cosmologies. So um, there is now a modality, the center-based modality is called Modalidad Institucional. The family modality, which is kind of like home visiting and those kinds of things, is called Modalidad Familiar. And then there is a Modalidad Propia, which means own modality. And that is for indigenous and rural and remote communities to propose. Our, within your quality standards, here are our curricular guidelines and our curriculum. Um, that fits within those general guidelines, but that is based on our cultural worldviews. So um, I think of many countries in the world that have done something that thoughtful. And right now, I think 17 indigenous communities have gone through that process. And it's designed to be a kind of a facilitation process within that community, too, to come up with that. Um, so, yeah, so that's a kind of interesting model for how a national policy um, can incorporate attention to indigenous um, languages and cultures. Excellent. So a reminder that all the graduate students get your oh, you get your own intimate session uh, with Harold starting in about um, let's say twenty five minutes at about thirty five after. But in the meantime, let's go to the um, lobby and again a warm thank you. Thank you. Thank you.